<clears throat> Hello, folks. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm Bradley Jay, and today our guest is Brendan Carney, who is with Walk Massachusetts, who is Walk Massachusetts, formerly Walk Boston. And we're here to address some safety issues that I haven't noticed pop up. Uh, I'm a pedestrian, and I'm concerned that in the rush to uh, green cycle power, the pedestrian is getting thrown under the bus, or more, more aptly, the bicycle. But also, I see things happening in bike lanes that endanger cyclists, and I'm going to whip through them, and Brendan's going, Brand, Brendan's going to address them. First, um, I see commercial motorized scooters uh, delivering f in, on behalf of commercial concerns in the bike lanes blowing through red lights. That's one of the reasons they go in the bike lanes, so they can go through the red lights, because it, it, they feel that folks don't expect that individuals in bike lanes will stop at red lights, because they don't. Also, the e-bikes e are getting faster and heavier, and there are multiple classes of e-bikes, and uh, which I think violate the spirit of the bike lane. And when you see a cyclist on a on a low or lower class e-bike or a regular bicycle, their expectations about the speed and weight of other vehicles in the bike lane, and these, I think, surpass it, and are especially dangerous when they ignore traffic signals in, in busy areas. And I'm not talking about, say, Framingham in a rural area where there's a stop sign and you look both ways, cricket, cricket, and nothing coming. I'm talking about busy intersections in a city. Uh, there are, uh, and then in general, cyclists, it seems, society doesn't expect uh, cyclists to obey the traffic laws. They've given them a pass, and, and for pedestrians, that creates a danger. Let me give you a scenario. You are a pedestrian. You're with your kids or your mother or alone. You're at a, a busy intersection. And you're waiting for the walk light dutifully. And, oh, the walk light goes. You kind of, you know, you expect there's an expectation, a reasonable expectation that the folks will, other folks will obey those traffic laws. You, of course, need to protect yourself by checking. But too often I have I've seen the walk light go positive for me. And I'll get ready to go. And some either motorized commercial vehicle in the bike lane, a heavy e-bike or a regular cyclist, blasting right by me, irritated, you know, like, hey, look out, even though I have the walk light. So there um, there seems to be uh, a need for um, a public expectation of obeying of the traffic, traffic laws, even for cyclists, even in bike lanes. And there needs to be strict rules about who can use the bike lanes. Can motorized vehicles use bike lanes? I'm a pedestrian. I think that that is, you know, that is a sacred thing. The most basic, greenest, most green method of transportation there is. I mean, even cyclists, bicycles, you have to use, you have to use uh, energy to make bicycles and rubber and all. If you really want to go green, you walk. And pedestrians at danger. I feel uh, like no one cares. I find out there's an organization called Walk Boston and Walk Massachusetts. I think, thank you. Thank you. Somebody, somebody cares. <laughs> and that would be <clears throat> Brendan Kearney, who is both <coughs> Kearney, excuse me, both a cyclist and a pedestrian and cares enough about walking so that he, he's for a long time had this this group walk boston which became walk massachusetts and i'm glad you became walk massachusetts because <clears throat> i don't live in boston i live right on the edge i can walk to boston i walk a lot it's good for my health i walk from brookline village to um porter square and back yeah, that's what i do and uh, it's good for you it's good for the it's good for the you, world you and, see a lot I, and i would i would like to see a little bit of attention paid to the pedestrian because I think they're being ignored in this in this bicycle rush. So I know that this is not the primary thing that you address, but it certainly has got to got to be up there because pedestrian safety 
must be important to an organization called Walk Massachusetts. Absolutely. Actually, so, yeah. so help me out, man. I feel all alone. I feel uh, no, like no, one, ca no one cares about the pedestrian. Yeah, there, there's a lot to respond to there. So I will, I will take a shot. I was taking some notes as you were going, but uh, so yeah, Walk Massachusetts, we're a statewide pedestrian advocacy organization. Uh, been around since 1990, formerly Walk Boston. We uh, changed our name earlier this year um, in April of 2023 because we have been doing stuff all across the state. Um, and, you know, I, I've actually never lived in the city of Boston proper. I, you know, went to Holy Cross, graduated uh, early 2000s, uh, lived in West Newton, Watertown, Somerville, Cambridge, like now lived in Framingham. Um, yeah, there are pedestrian issues kind of all over the state. And, you know, as an organization, we're trying to tackle a number of those. Um, just earlier this year, we released a crash report looking at fatal crashes across the state. Um, we actually used uh, MassDOT, the Department of Transportation's, their own crash data. Um, last year was a pretty bad year in the state uh, across all modes. You know, there, there were well over 400 fatal crashes, 435. Uh, 101 of those were actually people walking. Um, all of those involved vehicles. So, uh, you know, uh, all 101 of those people that were hit and killed were hit and killed by by drivers. Um, so I, I think that's important to, you know, start with here. Um, but, you know, crashes involving people biking and people walking, like, in the same crash, that, that is definitely a concern we have, like, for a number of the reasons that you brought up, where, you know, if there are heavier vehicles, uh, you know, sharing space with, with people walking, like, w what can we do to to make sure that those people are behaving properly? And I would um, think that cyclists would be concerned about commercial use of bike lanes. Yeah, I, actually, just last week, I, I was at an event that the city of Boston was hosting, and someone brought up the, uh, I would say the more and more use of the Southwest corridor as an area where some of those, you know, uh, delivery, delivery bikes, uh, more, they're more motorbikes, um, delivery motorbikes are, right. are used in the Southwest corridor to kind of avoid other areas. Right. Gas powered motorbikes are yes. being used to deliver, uh, things for commercial enterprises in bike lanes. And right. I can't, I can't remember. It's possible one of them stopped at a, a light, but one of the reasons I believe that they use the bike lanes is because there's no expectation they have to avoid, they have to obey any sort of traffic law. They just blow through stop signs. Right. It so, seems like, like if you're in the bike lane, there's an expectation. Eh, those those rules are for uh, the cars. Even though towns like Brookline have spent a lot of money for dedicated stoplights that even have a little picture of a dude on a bike, a person, I should say, on a bike, meaning, yeah, that's you, person on a bike, stop. We're talking about you. Okay. Go yeah, on. I mean, I, I think uh, more bike infrastructure is actually really good for pedestrians. Um, I, I think the, the more dedicated spaces for people biking, like it's because if people are biking on a sidewalk, it's because they feel unsafe in the street. So like having a dedicated space for cyclists is super important to, to make sure that there is also that dedicated space for pedestrians. So now you're, you're talking about like this next level of folks that aren't respect, respecting that kind of social contract that has come up with creating those dedicated spaces. Um, social contract, and I believe a legal contract, otherwise they wouldn't have a dedicated stoplight for, for cyclists. I, I and, and, right. and folks, I'm yeah. not the crabby old driver hating on cyclists. I'm the crabby old guy who doesn't want to get killed, you know, by a cyclist by when I cross the street. So yeah, go ahead. And, and de definitely appreciate that. I, I think one thing that has been concerning is there's been a, a bit of an arms race out on the street over the last 10, 15 years with increasing vehicle sizes. Um, and with those larger vehicles, maybe folks that are making deliveries on these what were bikes like are deciding that they need to be bigger and faster themselves which i, I think is like a slippery slope to a bad situation mm. um because it, it in my point of view like smaller vehicles is a good thing like not having 
big giant 18 wheel trucks deciding that they have to unload on beacon street to the trader joe's uh you know like if, if we could actually get smaller delivery vehicles making things like that um yeah all, all the better um see so yeah, i i think i think that is definitely one thing um i i was actually watching one of your videos and you were uh talking about some of the the crossings of the charles river um and, and like how you know people uh so oh right they, you saw that one where i was wearing the orange coat over there on... yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think some of those bridge crossings are super tricky because there there is like the expectation that if you're biking, walking, or running like along the Charles, like say you're on the Esplanade and you come up the ramp and you're on a shared use path there, you come up the ramp and you get up to you're on the Harvard Bridge, which is which is Mass Ave, which is no one calls it the Harvard Bridge, but that's what it's called. Um, you're there on Mass Ave, and if you were on a bike, you can't actually get into the bike lane from there because there's the the giant barrier. You're talking about the BU. Uh, no, you're talking about the yeah, the MIT Bridge. Yeah, the MIT yeah. Bridge. Right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you get up to Mass Ave, and if you were on a bike, you can't actually get into the bike lane because there is the the shoulder barrier there. Uh, like the crash barrier, so vehicles that go way too fast on that road uh, don't get onto the sidewalk or go over the bridge. Um, like the, so then those people are then sharing the sidewalk because it's technically there. It is a bit of a mixed use space again. It's still, but it feels like a sidewalk as a person. So walks. yeah, there's confusion. Like I think yeah. the broadcast I did is like a four or e but uh, e scooters. Mm -hmm. Where do they go on the sidewalk or in the bike lane? Right. Yeah, they should be using the bike lane, but like they can't get to the bike lane if, if they were coming up from the river there. So that that's problematic. So like there are some bigger projects and bigger proposals to like, all right, how do we make connections better? So people using a scooter or something like that can actually get into the bike lane. There's mm. a meeting coming up uh, later this week. I think it's on the 26th. Um, do you know what the Bowker overpass is? Or I heard of it. Is, is it Bowker overpass? I give up. I can't remember. Yeah. So it's basically like if you were if you were driving and you were on Starro Drive and you wanted to get to the fence, like okay, I do know. Yeah, it's, so the, that's, it's the it's the left you take, and you can either take a hard left or a soft left, and you yeah, can go to Kenmore exactly. or up to Fenway. Exactly. exactly, it's right there. So like there is uh, kind of a, a vision to like re-established the parkland that's underneath there it's called charles gate um and they're thinking as part of that like how do you reconnect that neighborhood to actually get to the river and get to the bridge cool so like it, it's the, check out the charles gate alliance they're doing some great work uh rethinking that and you know rethinking the the connections and like actually thinking about people walking and people biking and how you get to the river and the paths and all the the wonderful things there and related bit of good news they yeah. after years and years and years of struggle they opened the uh oh god what's the the old old bridge in brookline that was refurbished uh and comes onto the green necklace the uh, the emerald necklace now is it Clint, not clinton street uh the carlton street footbridge carlton street bridge <clears throat> i saw it's that's it so cool it's a yeah. way to get to a green space across the um the T tracks with a bike. Yeah, that and that took like twenty seven years. I know. <laughs> that that is uh it is kind of shocking how long some of these but like something like that, like those little important connections like make all the difference. And like that that could mean that you know what? I, I am going to walk or I am going to bike because I can avoid, you know, this terrible intersection at Park Drive or this terrible intersection over you know at, at the riverway and stuff like that yeah um, so like I, I think it's kind of lost on a lot of people like those just those little pain points of a, a one really bad intersection or two really bad intersections can make the difference of someone deciding to walk bike or you know i i'm gonna drive like or i'm gonna take an uber and stuff right like that. So, um so yeah knocking away at you know how do we fix a bunch of these little pain points that really it's kind of like 
pushing a rock up the hill sometimes. That's cool. Like, so that's know. part of the work you do. A absolutely. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're supporting uh, residents and communities across Massachusetts who are also like, you know, working on those pain points. I guess this is an aside. I don't drive in Boston at all anymore because it's too too difficult. Uh, mm. I came. I, I take the bus now. I'll, I'll take the T to get the bus to go to New Hampshire to visit family, mm. or I take the train, the T to the train to Maine because it's so confusing to drive. They have uh, bus only lanes, bus and bike. And then it'll be go. It'll go from being bus only to bus and bike. I don't know if I'm supposed to be there. Am I supposed to be in this lane? And then I gotta change lanes over here. But that lane doesn't take me where you want to go. I was so freaked out last time. I guess you, in order to survive in that world, you just gotta kind of ignore the trap. You know, I don't know what to do. So I'm taking the bus. I can't take it anymore. You know, you know what? And like, if there's a bus only lane, like that's probably makes your bus commute even better, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the bus only lane. There's an experimentation right out near my house with a, a bus only lane. A giant fan of bus only lanes. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yay. Uh, yeah. I, w I wish there were a, way, were a way to keep all motor vehicles out of downtown. And I know that some people experiment with that, and I know that's anathema to many. But, oh, imagine... For well, all kind of like downtown easy. crossing. How do they do it in downtown crossing? Can't we do that everywhere? Well, I, I'm sure right. that's naive of me. Yeah, I, I will say like, see, it, it has to be a mix of like carrots and sticks. Like you can't just be like, we can't, right? You, you can't drive here and stuff like that. But, but the improvements, you know, like seeing that a bus lane is, you know, shortening your trips and stuff like that. Oh, like, man, I love that's that. The, that's the carrot there. You can't just be like, let's ban everything here. It's like, no, like people need to make, you know, important trips, whether it's work trips to see family to, yeah, know. you know, even to just go and have fun. Like, right. Um, and I don't want to undermine my own argument by seeming like an extremist saying, <laughs> saying, saying that. But uh, one other thing as a driver, this is related. I'm scared of hitting a bicyclist. I'm so afraid of that. I'm afraid of taking a right-hand turn, you know, and I, and I have a light with me, and I just pray that there's not some cyclist blowing through the lights so they, hit, they mm -hmm. run into my right-hand side when I take a right-hand side, right-hand turn. That just, and, you know, and when, if that happens, your life is over. The way your li life as you knew it is over. If you accidentally killed someone on a bicycle, mm -hmm. even though they might be going through the light, I had a friend growing up, he, something like that happened. He drank himself to death out of horrible guilt. Mm. Uh, so th th all that stress just isn't worth it for me. So I love the tea. I have a tea pass. People make fun of the tea. They give the tea a hard time. Yeah, it's fraught with problems. But I can go from like my house to Union Square now. Thank God for that. So what about... Town spending money, back to my concerns, Ooh. town spending money on education. Just uh, posters that's, that say, you know, that just remind cyclists of what cyclists and users of uh, motor scooters, gas-powered motor scooters and e-bikes, to be courteous and to try to obey the law and try just try to instill that in people that that's kind of the right thing to do. And maybe some sort of enforcement. There's no will for enforcement or registration of cycles. I get that. I wish I would like some. Um, what's the word? Motivation for mm. people on bikes to not just be sco complete scoff laws at intersections. Any, yeah, any so, solutions for that? Yeah. So, City of Boston, uh, actually, the Disabilities Commission has been working on they just released a campaign they're calling boston breaks um and it is it's kind of like, like what you're talking about where it's more of a motivational campaign to like make sure that people biking understand that you know a, a person using a wheelchair like needs to use curb ramps and like might actually be using the bike lane and right. that they should be courteous and be sharing the space because to be honest, like there's a lot of sidewalks throughout 
Boston that are inaccessible. Like, and you know, someone using a wheelchair can't use the the sidewalk because it's too narrow because there are massive trees that have like moved all the the bricks and stuff like that. Um, so like it, Boston Breaks is really trying to um, br bring about that awareness to cyclists that they need to be courteous and that they, they should expect people in wheelchairs to be using the space. Right. Um, maybe, maybe legal action is not what should be motivating people, but just, Hey, uh, if you, if you do these things, you're a jerk. Right. Well, the, the other piece you mentioned legal action, like actually the city of Boston, like came to a consent decree, consent decree, um, earlier this year where they, uh, basically settled a lawsuit. They were, sued because they violated the Americans with Disabilities Act um, mm -hmm. because they're not moving fast enough to uh, replace curb cut, you know, add curb cuts that are actually accessible uh, and make sure that sidewalks are usable by anyone. Um, so I, I think I, I thought the number of curb cuts that they now need to replace is around 1600. Something I heard last week was the number is actually 1630 which is when boston, boston. was founded yeah uh, so the number of curb cuts that they need to replace yearly is 1630 as a as a nod to that which i think is is kind of an, that's kind cool of, kind of cutesy and like it's a number you'll remember yep um, so uh i'm hopeful that you know as part of that accessibility push like we can also like remind people that hey we're all getting around here and we need to do it safely. And if we need to share space at certain times, like that has to happen, slow down. <laughs> right. I'm going to personally ask my town, Brookline, to put to put their heads together, the people that run the town, to spend, uh, spend some time, money, and figure out how we can bring public opinion to the point where it's cool to be courteous and cool to obey the traffic laws and not endanger pedestrians, not throw the pedestrians under the, the bike, so to speak. And, and maybe even some sort of enforcement, some sort of light handed enforcement, just to, you know, remind people, I don't know. I don't exactly know how you do that. There has to be a, a way. One thing that's interesting is Americans in general are, are get away with whatever they can. Mm. Uh, if you go to Scandinavia, they obey the traffic laws. They, as a group, they choose to say, yep, we like these laws. They're good for us. We're going to obey them. It's a completely different uh, sentiment in at least where I live in Boston. Right. In, in Helsinki, no, yeah. the, there'll be no cars coming. Not one person will like dart across the street because mm -hmm. they have this, this social contract, I guess. They say, you know, this is how we're going to be. The, <clears throat> we like our rules they're here to protect us uh and we we obey them it's a complete, completely different scenario i don't know if whether they have better better leaders who make better rules but i would like to see a little bit of that here it's, it's, it's not yeah. we're we're still still sort of the the breakaway you know rebel nation <laughs> uh don't tread on me yeah. when it comes when it comes to oh don't tread on me with those traffic laws well, these, yeah. you know, I'm a bike rider. I, 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 I have been long oppressed, and so I have this opportunity to to, right. to fly yeah. my flag. Yeah, just just to to touch on that enforcement piece, uh, one second. The two separate things. First off, the the positive piece, like um, there's an organization, Mass Bike, that uh, they they understand that th there was actually law passed this past year that require cyclists to there was always the law that you had to have a white light on the front of your bike to make sure people can see you. But the law was updated to the law previously was you had to have a reflector or a red light on the back. It was changed to make it. So you have to have a reflector and a red light. Mm -hmm. So mass bike is doing a, like, I think they refer to it as their lights brigade um, where they have volunteers standing out at, heavily used intersections by by people biking um, and educating folks about like the update on the law and not only just educating 
they're actually handing out lights too because that's the piece that like that's once again getting back to that's the carrot right like we can't have it all be you're doing a bad thing you're doing it yep, yep. i'll stick um so they're actually giving them the lights too so i think that's important um they've also paired with um i think some police departments across the state to be like hey if you are going to be doing any education or or enforcement things can you give people lights like don't just write them a ticket give them lights so then going forward they can be seen so if bradley is driving and he's taking that right turn like the person biking will be seen so right they won't get in a crash as um, a guy on a bike can you imagine i we all all the time see people with zero lights wearing dark clothing isn't that blow you away like what are you suicide don't you know that riding a bike is the most dangerous thing you can do i, I would say it? like one thing that i've heard from other folks is knock on wood hasn't happened to me is that they left their bike lights on their bike and they came back to it at the end of the day and someone stole their lights so like maybe so you know i i always carry an extra like blinky like it's not as good and it won't light a path for me but if if i'm biking you know I, I usually have like an extra blinky light or two to at least get me by. Um, but yeah, because I want to be seen if I was yeah. Driving, right. Um, yeah, I if I if I were a cyclist, I would. Well, you saw what I wear as a pedestrian. You saw my bright orange coat. It's it's funny how you get so much more. Res this is strange, people. So much more respected at crosswalk when I'm wearing that orange coat. People stop like almost out of appreciation. Yeah, that I have taken the time to be visible, and I appreciate so much when cyclists go overboard on being visible like that too. I think yeah. good for you, man. Right. I, I will say, like I, I basically don't trust a driver if it's like dark and rainy. Like when I'm trying to cross the street, I, I don't trust that they see me no matter what I'm wearing. Um, so th that that's one thing. The other thing is there's this awesome company out. You should look up because you, this would be right up your alley. They're called. I Clean. like Brighton bright they're, garments yeah they're called cleverhood and yeah. they make like rain capes and i have a great like anorak jacket by them and like it looks some of the ones they make look very like fashionable and like they're great at rain prevention but they also have like stitched in like reflective fibers in it so like cool. it can look like a normal jacket but then you hit it with a a light and it's like whoa <laughs> Who, what's the company cleverhood c-l-e-v-e-r-h-o-o-d they're out of providence so that's really cool yeah i know you have a um another meeting at uh, noon yeah are there any more carrots that you can think of that, that could be offered to so solve the things yeah. that i perceive to be problems yeah i think one of the carrots is actually it comes from funding from the state for communities across the state to to make sure that there is dedicated funding to make things safer for people walking, biking, taking transit. They, they have a great program that they started during COVID called uh, Shared Streets and Spaces. It uh, allowed communities to not have to do full construction, but like test out things and use different materials. And this was a mass stop program. And I think what was so fantastic and successful was that they made the application process really simple and they also told them you have to install it quickly and send us photos so, so like you know it, it allowed communities to test out things because then you know down the road when you know we're actually redesigning this street or this intersection like oh the, the things we tested out yeah people liked that like make, making it safer to cross near the school is a good idea like um, so I think, I think that's a, a funding carrot. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's important. Anything that would make it cool to be safer at these intersections instead of, you know, me, 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 I know you have to go. I really appreciate what you do. You, you put in a lot of time for something that I think super important and, and uh, com coming full circle. Uh, I would, I would ask anybody if you have any suggestions as to how to not forget the pedestrian, the walker, in this very excellent uh, rush, or not rush, but in this movement towards uh, 
smaller vehicles and away from automobiles. That's a wonderful thing. Just please remember the pedestrian in, in these changes, right? A absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, feel free to reach out to, to me. Um, you can, our website is actually walkboston.org still. Uh, you can go to walkmass.org. It'll redirect there. Um, but yeah, find me on the staff page. Reach out. Love to love to see how we can help you. Brendan Carney, you spe you pronounce it Carney. Absolutely. Yeah. I, rem I, rem I remember that. Seriously, you know, I, I really appreciate all the time you put into this. It's, you you spent a lot of time, and thank you very much. Thanks, Bradley. Thanks for having me. Everybody, anybody, if you uh, if this resonates with you, please share it. That is a giant, giant, giant help. Take care and have a, a good rest of your day, Brendan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Don't leave me 